So we've got another business leaving downtown San Francisco. Shocking. I know, right? It's like, what? Why? 45 podcasts later, here we are. Gaming company leaves downtown San Francisco office for Las Vegas. Huh. Yeah. How about them apples? Let's get into it. Here we go. Mobile gaming company Skills, with a Z, is leaving downtown San Francisco and to open new headquarters in Las Vegas, according to the Las Vegas Sun. Publicly traded esports company was headquartered at 1061 Market Street and was founded in March 2012. The company helps mobile game developers monetize their games by hosting online tournaments. Here's your property. Here's the tenderloin. Here's the TL. And there's your sign. Right? So this story isn't about escaping the tenderloin necessarily because the company hasn't even really said much about their departure. Las Vegas is picking it up because they're like, hey, hey, we got another business. We got another big business coming our way. But if you're a company and you've got one foot in, out the door and you're in close proximity to the tenderloin, I think it just makes that that exit stage left just that much easier. Okay. In bigger space, better space in Vegas. Plus, we get a gamble. Plus, that's kind of where a lot of stuff is shifting to. Gambling stuff, that's a no-brainer, right? So that's what this company is working on. But, you know, so there's there's so much about development in San Francisco because of all the folks you've got to be able to pull from that tech pool of employees. So, but if you're a company who's already got space there and you're already hosting folks and you've got space that, yeah, it, you know, it, it's in San Fran and it's, you know, it's been historically, it's been a cool location to have your company and it's made sense. But if you're in that close proximity to the tenderloin, you might just say, you know what? We're going to reimagine and rethink our future in Vegas. We're going to go do a little gambling. And we're going to have more of a stable environment to have our employees work. Plus, it probably just makes sense for this company, it sounds like, right? So the company helps mo um, real money gaming in Vegas have this really long tradition of history in the United States. And we just see this huge opportunity to help Vegas move into this next era of real money games. Skills CEO Andrew Paradise told the Las Vegas Sun. It's 36,000 square foot office in the Southwest Las Vegas Valley will be completed in late 2023. Paradise told the Las Vegas Sun. So they've already got it going, right? They've got office space going. It's going to be done here soon. And they've just announced we're going to make this transition. We're leaving San Fran. We're going to go to our new space, our new big space. Skills already has an office in Las Vegas staffed with around 100 people. The new headquarters will hold around 200 employees. In contrast, some local tech companies have begun to call their workers back to San Francisco offices and away from home working. There's that big shift going on right now. So you've got Amazon kind of led the way. Facebook or Meta has dictated to their employees they want, you know, three days a week back in the office. And people are saying, no. We do not want this. And people are openly saying at Amazon, no, we don't want this. They've, they've gone as far as having a walkout, right? Where somewhere between 300 and 2,000 Amazon employees walked out, depending on whether you believe Amazon or the activists, as we're going to call them. But for a lot of these employees that are already working on teams where you've got different people in different parts of the United States and different parts of the world, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be coming back into the office. And we were all told, hey, you know, for the betterment of mankind, we need everybody to go work from home. It's going to be great. We're going to love it. And then, we'll, you know, we'll all come back after this whole pandemic thing is uh, is over. And the problem there, and I was texting with, the, with, with a really good friend this morning, and I was like, the genie is out of the bottle. You let people have their freedom. They don't want to go into the office. They don't want to commute. They don't really want to see their coworkers. They deal with their coworkers enough via email, text, phone, video conferencing, you know, whatever it is. They're like, yeah, I do I really want to go back and sit in the cubicle? Same thing I do when I sit at my desk at home. I mean, do I want to battle traffic and commuting and all that and then be in a, a building in San Francisco? A lot of companies are saying no. 
we don't want to do that. And a lot of companies are saying, you know, we want to, the employees to, to come back into downtown and the employees are saying, not so much, not so much. Our commute times here in Seattle after Amazon went back, I got to get tall. Hold on. It's only like an inch, but I can really feel it on my legs. Our commute in Seattle has gotten horrific since Amazon went back. It used to be Boeing and Boeing's, um, their shifts. All right. You got the 3 a.m. shift letting out, letting out, and that's going to impact the 5 a.m. commute. You know, you had that kind of stuff with Boeing. And now it's Amazon because everybody commutes into downtown into South Lake Union and it just jams up traffic immeasurably. I mean, what used to take for, you know, 40 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes is now sometimes taking an hour and a half. Welcome to return to the office, right? And this argument that, well, we've got this synergy, we've got all this energy, maybe, maybe, but I think that's optimistic at best. I think bottom line is people got a taste of their freedom. They don't want to go back to the office. And so that's going to have a massive impact on, on office space. And it's already doing that. And you're going to see, you know, revenues decline just a whole, got that doom loop thing going on, right? So in contrast to some local tech companies have been calling their, their employees back. However, the office vacancy rate in downtown San Francisco is at a record high. It's somewhere over 30%. Not good. A third. I've been doing podcasts about, you know, biggest hotel in San Francisco, biggest hotel outside of Vegas. And there, the owner just, uh, it's a dual, it's a two for one. It's a, uh, it's a Hilton property and they're giving that back to the bank. They're defaulting on their loan. We've had multiple instances of, you know, properties being foreclosed and sold, selling at a fraction after they've been repoed, selling at a fraction of what they, you know, were once estimated at or market value. And we've got properties under contract right now that are literally at a fraction of what they were once selling for not that long ago. You know, 2019 numbers were at the absolute peak, you know, you had uh, occupancy of hotels just, you know, 84%. These insane numbers because the market was just screaming in 2019. We had a different president there. I'm I'm just going to say, I'm just going to throw that out there. We did not have uh, Mr. Stumble up the stairs as our uh, fearless leader in chief. So, however, the office vacancy rate in downtown San Francisco is at a record high. Downtown uh, in in retail... This is a, you know, an example of something nearby to where this company is moving out of. And retail, Nordstrom announced in May that this summer it would close its store in Westfield San Francisco Center, which is nearby the former skills office. The department store is also shutting down the Nordstrom Rack across Fifth Street from the mall, blaming both closures on the dynamics of the uh, downtown San Francisco market or deteriorating street conditions, meaning it's just a shit show. I mean, plain and simple, right? Plain and simple. A few blocks away, Whole Foods flagship store at Market and 8th Streets announced its closure in April due to staff safety concerns and 568 911 calls in 13 months, including an overdose in their restrooms. So if, you know, go, getting back to our, our esports company, if, if if you've got one foot out the door and you're like analyzing rent, and you're analyzing your lease and you're going, let's see, well, this is a market we probably need to be in. We already got a portion of our employees here. We're going to have bigger space, better space, and our employees are going to have access to cheaper, more affordable housing. And there's a big push to go to Vegas versus San Fran. I mean, if you've already got some place to go and you're not, you know, being forced out, because it doesn't feel to me like this company is being forced out from a standpoint of, all right, we've had XYZ break-ins and, you know, go down that road and people pooping on our sidewalk, which they probably have been, but it's not like they're operating a retail store. They've just got office space there, right? In San Fran. So a little bit different there, but if you're that close to the tenderloin and, and you've got other options, you're going to take those options. It's not going to take too much of a, you know, to get you going out the door, right? 
So we got the Whole Foods flagship store announced its closure in April due to staff safety concerns, amongst many other you know, frightening conditions. The old Navy flagship store, not far from the former school's office, is also closing down. Okay, well, yeah, that's closing down because the Gap owns Old Navy and you've got this little thing called the retail apocalypse. But then, you know, making the decision to, all right, which stores are not, perf- oh yeah, that one near the Tenderloin, it gets robbed on the daily about 14 times. Okay, close that one. It's just not hard decisions to make, right? Based on deteriorating st- street conditions. It's one of the many major storefronts to flee downtown San Francisco in recent months. So nearly half of Union Square stores have closed since 2019, though several new stores have started operations in the neighborhood recently. Hmm. They may want to they may want to reimagine and rethink those new operations near the Tenderloin. I mean, what are people thinking? And the upscale home furnishing store Coco Republic said on May 10, it would leave its three-story show place at 55 Stockton Street, which just opened last fall. Let's take it. That was, um, I, I believe that was a, I think that that's a, uh, that was an Australian company, I believe. That was uh, Home Furnishings. And they just didn't know what they're getting into in San Fran. San Francisco, let's run a store there. It's got great shopping opportunities. And then they get there and, oh, well, I, it is San Francisco. Let's take a run at this. A year later, no, nope, we're out. No can do. This isn't working out. Not enough people want to come to the store. Our three-story show place, no can do. We're gone. Not shocking, right? Let's take a look and see where 55 Market Street is. So there, here's here's your 55 Stockton Street, and big red button, tenderloin. That's all you need to know, right? That is basically in the tenderloin. That is in the tenderloin. Ugh brutal. It's got to be just terrible. I mean, who, who's, who's thinking, okay, yeah, hey, this is a really attractive price on this lease. Eh, outside doesn't seem to be too bad. It's not horrible. You know, San Francisco, it's got, got a couple, you know, couple of issues. We'll take it. One year later, we're out. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is literally what we're talking about. How many millions did they spend getting that space ready? So it's not shocking if another company has, you know, has business elsewhere that they're working on. And like, hey, you know, I, I think I think we're going to consolidate. It's not you, it's us. We're going to consolidate all our employees somewhere other than in the tenderloin. Not a tough decision to make. Not a tough decision to make. Skills did not respond to requests for comment by publication time because they are out. They do not care. They ain't coming back. Bye-bye, San Francisco. And that's what so many of these companies are doing, right? I mean, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. That when you've got a, you know, street conditions the way that you do in San Francisco, and there's also all these other factors going on. And, you know, San Francisco is not unlike Seattle, not unlike Portland, where business leaders in the downtown cores have been struggling to get, you know, other companies to come into downtown. And so what that does is it just, you know, all the all the folks that would be, you know, making that downtown vibrant, it's just a ghost town. It's just a ghost town. And that's what I consistently hear people who are visitors to downtown San Francisco and specifically the financial district. They go there and they're like, man, there's just nobody here. And it's because you've got a, you've got a lack of tourists wanting to come to the area. And then you've got a lack of folks that would normally be in those big high rise settings, you know, and you got that vibrant, you know, walking around kind of that you know, downtown Manhattan feel where you've always just got a lot of people. San Francisco isn't ever that bad, but it is a concrete jungle, right? It's just a smaller version. You know, it doesn't have the massive skyscrapers like New York does just, you know, an entire huge skyline. It's a smaller version and Seattle's even smaller. And so all of these downtown cores have been struggling because you got this whole remote work thing and people don't want to do it. And so there's this you know, push. And if companies have the opportunity to ditch and go elsewhere, they're making that move right now in droves. And this one isn't necessarily, again, 
like I said, they're not being forced out, but they've got pretty good incentive to get out and they don't even need to say anything because this article here picked up how many different little business, not bit little businesses, but businesses that have jettisoned and have said, Hey, deteriorating street conditions. That's our number one concern here. This isn't going in the right direction. Um, we out, we out. So, you know, a, a lot of what I talk about is the, the big office buildings and, uh, or the big, you know, big skyscrapers. That's kind of, that's, that's what's really in play right now. But I, I think part of the understanding there is that it's not an enormous portion of commercial real estate. Commercial real estate per se, a lot of that is think the vast majority of that, like three quarters of it. And I'm totally generalizing there, but something like that is like midsize office space for like medical, right? Or it's retail office space, or it's all this other stuff. It's not necessarily the big buildings in downtown, but the big buildings in downtown are typically financed by mid-tier regional banks. That's who gets involved with financing the big, the big skyscrapers, you know, in, in various different, uh, in various different cities. And in San Francisco, you had like First Republic, you know, which is a lender that just, you know, basically got taken over. And you've got some real liquidity problems with some of these mid-tier banks. So there's concern there. So a small portion or maybe a quarter of all commercial is kind of in play. And a lot of the loans that were made on these commercial buildings took place during the Great Recession and now they're coming due. I think there's they're something like $15 trillion worth of commercial loans that are coming due before the end of 2025. And so now you've got, you've got property owners that are going, okay, my loan is coming due. You got a bunch of debt. We got to pay. Um, my numbers are way down. I don't have the financials to refinance. And also if I refinance, I'm going to be refinancing at a much higher interest rate than what I had back then, more than likely. We don't really know exactly, you know, what, what each building's numbers are, but you've got multiple things that are kind of pushing back against their ability to do a refinance. So we've got all these buildings in, in every market that are going to have some exposure and whether or not these property owners can figure out a workaround is going to be really interesting. But it's not like all of, you know, commercial is going to go sideways. There's just a certain percentage and it's an important percentage because if you have a failure, you know, at that level, it's going to rock the rest of the boat. It always does. Does it rock residential? Eh, you know, financing on residential is a different deal. But if, if something hits bad enough, yeah, it impacts everything, right? It's kind of like when we have a when a, when a war breaks out and all the markets get rocked because markets, financial markets do not like instability. And when you have bank failures, you know, what does the stock market do? It's like, ah, this isn't good. We don't like the looks of this. This isn't good. Somebody needs to step in and take this bank over stat. One of the bigger impacts that we're going to see from this type of you know, exodus from the marketplace. And when you've got a 30% or, you know, probably greater than 30% vacancy rate, which is really high in commercial, it's not, it's San Francisco is registering some of the highest commercial vacancy that they have ever seen higher than the great recession, which is, you know, our most recent, you know, we don't, I don't think they kept numbers back through the great depression. Plus we didn't have, you know, the proliferation of all these businesses and office space back then in 1929 that we do now. But one of the biggest impacts will be on city budgets because now you don't have the revenue coming in from you've got businesses going the wrong direction. You got businesses shutting down, leaving, moving out of town, moving to Vegas pulling the plug. And so all those tax revenue dollars, businesses, you know, the, the income coming in to property owners, now they're giving up, you know, properties, deed in lieu of foreclosure. You know, you've got excise taxes that are just way down because things are selling for way less. So all of that goes into the, the overall component of, 
hey, you got less revenue. And, you know, city budgets are already, San Francisco is going to be at a billion dollars upside down is, is, is my understanding. A billion dollars. It's like 750 million now. And, you know, whatever the number is, it's enormous. And it's going to take a while to bring things back. And that's if you can get back on that road. But you're going to hear a lot about just, hey, we've got a massive budget shortfall. And that's because we've had so many kind of things go on. And in these cities, specifically, these types of cities, where you've got leadership that has allowed street conditions to get where they are, where they've decriminalized everything, including drugs and the crimes that you know, drug addicts need to be able to support their next fix. They decriminalize those to the point where they're just misdemeanors. And why wouldn't this activity keep going on? So these criminals that are stealing from the community, stealing from businesses, and the addicts doing their thing on the streets, it's kind of created this perfect storm on top of the whole work from home to create this doom loop of now, okay, we don't have enough money to run the city. We don't have enough money to run Metro Transit. So now we can't get people encouraged to come back on our transit into downtown. So fewer people are coming in, less vibrant downtown, less restaurants, less laundromats, less whatever. You know, you got boarded up shops, you've got boarded up businesses, fewer people, and that doom loop just kind of keeps on a going. How extensive that doom loop will be, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say, but I, you know, I, I think we're gonna, it's gonna be with us for a while because the conditions, the the whole work from home thing is one of those big ones where, and businesses are really trying to figure out, they're trying to work out right now. Okay, number one, what can we get our employees to agree to? Because they're bitching and moaning and complaining. Oh, well, we don't wanna come back into the office. All right. And, and and that is a mixed bag. Some of that is, all right, uh, you have very valid reasons for not wanting to go back into downtown. They just do. And then some of it is they just don't want to go back. And you know what? I don't really blame them because it's like, okay, they were promised, hey, we're just going to do this temporarily. And then it's like three years later, you know, as that work from home thing became longer and longer, companies told their employees, hey, this is working out great. This is the best thing ever. You remember right at the beginning, everybody said, we're never going back to the office. And now you've got that struggle. Oh, hey, you know, leadership within the city and leadership within the business community is saying, we need to come back into the office because things ain't going well in the downtown. And this is kind of what we need to get things going again. Everybody knows that. And it's, it's kind of a self-serving thing, right? We need this city not to fail. We need this downtown corridor to have some activity, to have some vibrancy. We got to get some more bodies in there. And in San Francisco, the opposite of the thing is happening. And you do have a few businesses opening up. And I'm kind of like scratching, like, like Ikea in, in San Francisco is going to open up. I'm kind of scratching my head. It's And it's no different than Seattle with, um, oh, it's, the, it's a Chinese clothing store, Uniqlo. Uniqlo opened up a store basically at the northeast end of the Blade. Now, they've got massive security presence, but it's like, okay, what were you thinking that you knew what you were getting into, you know what you're getting into in San Fran, and you don't want to be the next Coco Republic. You know, we lasted one year. We lasted even less than Whole Foods. The Whole Foods just, just got ramrodded. And they came right out, you know, they came right out and said, yeah, it's not safe. It is not safe for our folks. So it's not safe for these folks. It wasn't safe for Cocoa Republic. And if you have any other options, you're going to take those. And I'm going to cover them right here on News for Reasonable People. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you hit that notification bell. Check us out on Discord. We've just added a new channel on Discord on Reasonable Plus. And it's... um. It's a debate channel. You can go in there. You can throw out your argument. I don't even know what it's called, but check out Reasonable Plus Discord. Got a few hundred members. Got a bunch of stuff going on. We've got a section on there called Rock On, where I post videos that I like of old school rock videos or new school rock videos. I just posted one by Limp Biscuit. We do it all for the nookie. That's what I'm going to leave you with. We do it all for the nookie. Thanks again for being here. We'll catch up soon. Bye for now. (laughs) 